Well, revenge uh, is something that most Jesus followers uh, probably or shouldn't spend a lot of time dwelling on. Uh, You should not be using a lot of your brain cells thinking about how you could get even with somebody or get back with somebody. But the reality is, let's just say a car cuts you off and going down a main street there in front of Pioneer, and they're very rude about it, and then they are speeding away, and there at the Circle K, there at uh, Trendale Road in Main Street, they are pulled over by one of Archdale's finest. Do you just smile a little bit? Not really a revenge thing, but like, well, well, well. There you go, buddy. Uh, that's just uh, just one of those things, human nature. And then some of you may think uh, maybe your spouse was rude to you uh, that day. And then in the middle of the night, they're going to the facility and they stump their toe on a corner of a real piece of wood furniture. And they say, out so loud, it wakes you up. And maybe you go back to sleep just a smiling. Not that you uh, wanted revenge, but rather sometimes in our human nature, it just feels good to see the bad guy get his once in a while, right? And uh, we shouldn't live that way. Uh, That shouldn't be the gas that keeps us going. But there is something that we think, man, if people just ought to get, if they do the crime, they should do the, the time, right? And so, however, when it's reversed and when it's our turn to get what we deserve, when we've been the one in error and we've done wrong, then on that side, I tend to want a lot of grace. Are you all that way? I never really want what I deserve or what I have coming to me because, I mean, that's just no fun. It's much more fun to watch somebody else get theirs than me get mine. The reality is in this thing, faith, our Christian walk, our following Jesus, the reason that we are here, and if you're born again, if you have a relationship with God, if you are saved and on your way to heaven, the reason you can say that is because God chose to not give you and I what we deserve. That's grace. That's God's mercy. That's his love for us and the fact that he chose to not give us what we deserve. We've been talking about a man named uh, David, and last week he uh, took out a giant named Goliath. Saul uh, was still king at the time, but things were, were going south. Saul is losing his mind. He has gotten to the point where he can't speak uh, correctly. He, he has, uh, I don't know, just lost it. Dementia, Alzheimer's, I don't know what he had, but he, had, he was clearly losing his mind. All right. David has just killed the giant. David is a, a new kid on the block, and he is there, and, and he, people like him. I mean, people like somebody who a little boy can take out a giant with a rock. I mean, that's pretty cool. So his popularity is growing. And so Saul is on his way out. And David comes on the scene, and he, his campaign slogan was basically, make Israel great again, right? And uh, so that's his happening. He's going to keep the kingdom united. The people are excited about David. He is on his way. But remember, Saul is still alive. Saul hates David. Saul has been hating on David for 10 years now. But God has taken his hand off of Saul, and David is going to be the new king. Day, uh, Saul had a son named Jonathan, who was David's BFF. They were like great friends. And as some little boys do, maybe way deep in Randolph County, certainly not in the city part, but some boys used to spit in their hand and shake on it. Any of you boots and guns people ever do that? Yeah, there I thought, I thought that. Anyway, th- this was Jonathan and David, okay? So they had made this commitment to each other. Hey, we are friends for life, except they didn't use spit. They used blood. Now, that's way deep in Randolph County, right? I mean, that's way deep. And so they uh, did the blood thing. And it was basically a blood covenant, which I personally believe was a foreshadow of the blood covenant God would make uh, through Jesus for us. But that was the kind of friends they were. Jonathan's daddy hated David. And yet they were best friends. Jonathan was smart enough to know that my daddy is crazy and he really belongs in an asylum somewhere. And Jonathan made the the decision. He said, you know what? This crazy, this nutso, 
this doing your own thing, this is going to stop with me. Even though Jonathan was next in line for the kingdom because it was passed down, Jonathan said, this is not God's will. God has anointed David. God has placed his hand on David. So therefore, I am going to submit to the will of God, even though my daddy is crazy. How many of you have crazy people in your ancestry? If you didn't raise your hand, you're probably the one. But anyway, uh, another church, they're talking about you somewhere probably. But uh, if you don't have uh, crazy in your family, so be it. But probably everybody got a little bit of crazy somewhere in there. Uh, anybody have uh, an addiction problem in your family? Yeah. Addiction? Um, nerve issues? Any murders in your families? It's all right. You probably just don't know, but probably somewhere back there. Anyway, anybody got any adulterers in your family? Adulterers, yeah. Maybe that's how you got here. I don't know, but it's like, you know, we, it, it, it happens. Okay. Now, hear me good. About 65, 70% of you are new to the faith. You have just decided in the past several years that you're going to follow Jesus Christ. Thank God for you. You're saved by grace. He loves you. You're going to have to do like Jonathan. And you're going to have to say, you know what? Mama may have been nutso. Daddy may have been an alcoholic. Papa may have been an adulterer. You, maybe you've got some of your family members in prison right now because of some bad decisions they made. But hear me good. Just because great-granddaddy and granddaddy and daddy did it doesn't mean you have to do it. And some of you have come out of that. And we have young people and youth, and your parents aren't here because they're too sorry. They went to the beach. They went somewhere else, but you chose to be in church. Listen, you're going to have to continue to be the person that says, you know what? The lack of following Jesus, the half-hearted, lukewarm Christianity, that stops with me. Stops with me. You don't have to do something just because of the environment you were raised in because if anybody had an excuse to be crazy, it was Jonathan. His daddy was Looney Tunes, all right? And Jonathan says, you know what? I am clear enough to see what the will of God is, and I'm going to do life God's way. I'm going to back God's man. And even though daddy hates my best friend, he's still going to be my best friend because God has his hand on him. It's a decision. Everybody has a free will choice. You have a choice to choose whether or not you're going to do life God's way. Jonathan said, you know what? As for me, I know what God's will is, and that is what I'm going to do. So if you have crazy in your family, if you have a long history of baggage in your family, do not assume that you're going to end up that way. You can choose. You know what? As for me and my house, we're going to serve God, even though that wasn't Pepal's slogan. But as for me, I'm going to do life God's way. The battle in Israel, it's heating up. People are killing each other. People are trying to kill David's people. And you know, when God has his hand on you, no devil, no military, nobody can touch you. And this was David's thing. So David's popularity is growing. The girls are all singing about David, how many thousands he's killed, and all this is going great. David is just, he is great. Things are going great. He is riding into the palace. Saul's people are dying. Saul is dead. His cabinet is dead. The military captain is dead. And his son Jonathan is dead. Jonathan is David's what? BFF, you textures, all right? And uh, they're close. David is now king in 2 Samuel chapter 9. He has now been hated for Saul for 10 years. He is on the throne. And what is one of the first things he does? You would think he would say, all right, guys, go out and find anybody left who likes Saul. Anybody who was loyal to Saul, make sure you, you take them completely out. Let's do a social media campaign and tell everybody in Israel how bad Saul was, how crazy he was, how he belonged in the bin. Let's make sure everybody knows where we stand. Let's appoint judges all over Israel who will back, who will do what we want to do. Let's have all these executive orders. 
that will tilt things in our favor. And David does just the opposite. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 1. Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left in the house of Saul that I may show him what? Not retribution, not hate, not kill them. For whose sakes? For Jonathan's sake. For Jonathan. You mean don't kill him, don't wipe out? You mean show kindness to somebody who has been against me? Show kindness to a family and an administration that has hated me for 10 years? To show kindness to somebody who's not like me? David is a giant killer. He is a ladies' man, and his good looks are going to continue to grow, as, well, as you'll see later on down the road somewhere. He's a ladies' man, and he is king. He doesn't need Saul. He doesn't need Jonathan. He doesn't need any of Saul's friends. But David said, I'm now king. Is there anybody in that family who hated me, who tried to kill me, to destroy me, to do all they could to keep me from getting to be king. Is there anybody left in that family? Because if there is, I want to show them kindness for who? Jonathan's sake. Why Jonathan? Go to 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 42. 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 42. Then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace. Since we have both sworn in the name of the Lord, saying, May the Lord be between you and me, and between your descendants and my descendants, how long? Forever. So he arose and departed, and Jonathan went to the city. I mean, David, oh my gosh, what a guy. He kept his word. He made this uh, covenant. He made this commitment to Jonathan way out in the field somewhere playing kickball or shooting guns. I don't know. But he made that commitment to Jonathan and said, hey, you and I, we're in this forever. And as long as I'm alive, I'm going to look after your descendants. And you do the same for me. A politician that keeps their word? Where is David at today, right? Who cares about somebody else? Oh, my gravy, what in the world? Come on, David, we need you now, right? And David said, for Jonathan's sake, I'm going to show him kindness. They look. When Saul and his people were being run out of town, killing them, dead, 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 after another, people, lots of people died. Jonathan had a kid named Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth's nanny gets word, oh my goodness, they're coming to get us. They're going to kill us too. Servants dead. She thinks, you know what, I'm going to get this kid who, a young, just a, just a young kid, five years old. I want to get him and we're going to run for our life. And you Sunday school people know the story. They're running through the palace, falls down. Mephibosheth falls, breaks his feet unable to walk. He's a cripple. Now, they didn't have an orthopedic surgeon back then. So he was messed up for life. Now, his pawpaw was king. His daddy was the king's son. He's living his best life, for real. Life is great. Mephibosheth had all, loads of toys, all kind of everything he could want. In a split moment, his nanny picks him up, trying to save his life. He falls, and he will be a crippled for the rest of his life. David sends out, they're looking for this, this guy. Mephibosheth reads on Facebook that David's coming to look for him. Think he was scared? His whole family wiped out. Why would David spare him? He was probably afraid. He was scared. Didn't know what was going to happen. He's brought in to the king. 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 7. 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 7. And David said to him, Do not what? Think that was a relief to this kid? Ooh, yeah. 
For I will surely show you what? Kindness. And here's why. For Jonathan, your father's sake. And I'm going to restore to you what? All the land of Saul, your grandfather. And you shall eat bread at my table continually. Think I'm a fit chef. Probably smiling about now, right? I'm getting back Paul Paul's land. Yes. Getting back his chariots. Yes. I'm going to be able to still eat in the king's house, even though Papa was dead and Daddy's dead. I'm still going to get to. Eat here, but here's the difference. He can't walk. Can't walk. He can look out the window and see the land, but he can't farm it. He can't walk out there and pick the beans or the corn or whatever they were growing back then. I mean, he can't, he can't do that. He can go to the table and eat, but somebody has to carry him and put him at the table. And I thought, Mephibosheth, man, what? That's terrible. A little kid, five years old, being crippled, and it's like, oh man. He wasn't born that way. It happened. And I thought, David gives him back almost everything he had except for his health, except for the ability to be able to walk. You see, Mephibosheth was an innocent victim in all this. He was a little baby when his papa was going against God. He was a little baby when the war was going on. And I thought, wow. Did Saul realize that his sin was going to go right to his his grandchild. Did Saul know that his turning his back on God and saying, you know what, I'll do things my own way. I'll ignore what God has said and I'll do life my own way. I'll run this kingdom like I want to. I don't think he really thought of baby Mephibosheth paying lifelong consequences for his decision. I know this statement is very controversial, and some of you absolutely do not believe this, but I'm going to tell you good, I have seen it happen, both in the Bible and in real life. The sins of the parents, this is the Bible, you look it up, the sins of the parents, they visit the next and the next and the next and the next generation. There is no other way to describe this. The reason that nanny was running with him was because she was trying to save his life, but the reason his life was in danger was because of Papa. Papa made a bad decision, and Mephibosheth paid, with hundreds of others, paid the price, and he would deal with it till as long as he lived on planet Earth. Now, I want to tell you, if you have no other reason to decide, you know what, I'm going to stand up and do different than what my parents and grandparents did, here is your reason. Because why you can be forgiven of sin, and hear me good, the blood of Jesus washes away every sin, but it doesn't take away the scars. It doesn't. I wish it did. Oh, my goodness, I wish it did. The scars of addiction, you can be set free. Yeah, absolutely, I believe that. But the scars are still there. And mom and dad, and here's what I want you to think very carefully. We, there's loads of people who think that this minor decision, and yes, I know I said this six weeks ago, that this minor decision will have no effect on my kids and grandkids. You might want to read your Bible, and you might want to read this entire story of Jonathan, Saul, and Mephibosheth. Because Mephibosheth is paying the price because of what? Not his daddy. Remember, daddy was good. He was a good guy. But Paul, Paul made a dumb decision to turn his back on God, and Mephibosheth has paid the price. Believe it or not, there is something to generational faith. Hear me good, it doesn't save you. 
No, no, no. You can't get saved on Paul Paul's religion or his faith. But there is something to it. And for those of you who have a godly heritage, your parents were saved, Papa was saved, Granny was saved, Nana was saved, whatever the list goes on, wherever you call them, kooky and all these other things we call grandparents these days. I don't know what's going on with that, but they're all saved, let's say. I want you to ask yourself, is your faith as strong as Paul Paul's faith? Is your commitment to Jesus Christ as strong as your parents' faith and Paul Paul's faith and ever how far back you can remember? Because see, this thing, don't be the generation that flips this thing and starts going the other way. If you don't love Jesus like Paul Paul did, then you're slipping. Hmm? You're slipping. And so you may be uh, the blessing of God, the godly heritage. Don't be the one to reverse it either. Don't be the one to say, you know what, uh, all that's not necessary. All this prayer and all this Bible reading and all this faithfulness to church like Papa did. Oh, my goodness. You know what? My grandma was a godly woman. And I think sometimes if she knew some of the things I think and say, she would do flips in her grave. I think if my grandma knew the innermost parts of even her good-looking preacher grandson, (laughs) I'm afraid she might say, you're a little lukewarm. But it was different then, wasn't it? It was different. I never saw my grandma wear a pair of pants. She would walk in this church. And she'd say, Mickey, have you told him how to get saved? You say, that's legalism. It is. It is legalism. And we're getting ready to get to that last point. Legalism doesn't save. But here is my thinking. If this thing continues, and if my standards aren't like grandma's standards, and my mama's standards weren't like quite as stiff as grandma, and then my standards, and then Colton and Caroline, I mean, drummer boy, on Labor Day weekend, says, I'm going to go to the beach with the youth pastor's son. (laughs) Just being honest. But they're in church, right? They are in church. Because they were raised right, right, walkers? They were raised right. They're in church. Check Life 360, make sure they're in church. But uh, I I think they are. I'm going to have to repent right here and now, but I think they're in church. Um, But I thought, what if the standard keeps getting less and less and less? Man, two generations from Colton and Caroline, there may not be a browse walking with Jesus. Oh, my goodness. And I believe in that. I really do. I believe you can pass along what it's like to follow Jesus And I believe you can pass along what it's not like to follow Jesus. I don't want to be Saul. I want to be the one that's like a Jonathan and says, we're going to serve Jesus. We're going to walk with Jesus. Some of you right now, your adult kids are not in church. You can't get them to come. Some of you got grandkids. You can't get them to come to church. And and hear me good. I got a 16 and 20-year-old that I still control with the pocketbook. Okay, so I don't know what's going to happen. Hopefully, one day when they're paying their own bills. Okay, I don't know what's going to happen then, and I don't know. So hear me good. I'm not preaching at you. I'm in this with you. Okay, I don't know. So we, we don't have those. We don't have those guarantees. But here's one thing I know. I do believe, and Dana, would, I think she would agree with me on this, more than anything, like that other song we said, Wherever he went. Oh, he's right there doing something else. Give me Jesus. You can have this world. I want that to be their song. 
I want that to be their prayer. And what I want from, I want Caroline and Colton to be a better Christian than Daddy, not less. I want them to be faithful to God more than Daddy, not less. I want them to raise their kids better than their daddy, mom and daddy did. I want them to teach and disciple their kids better, not less. How do we make that happen? I'm going to tell you what a, a wise person told me years ago. The most important thing you can do as a parent is not ball games. It's not school supplies. It's not clothes or Santa Claus. It's on your knees and pray that Almighty God would put his hand on them. What happened to Saul? Mm. He went crazy, but it started with little things. We said a few weeks ago, remember? A few little things. And it took this downturn. Mephibosheth, he's saved. David, an Old Testament picture of Christ, I believe. The covenant Jonathan David had, I believe, was a forerunner of the covenant, the blood covenant that God would make with us through Jesus. Mephibosheth was in the king's palace, not because he deserved it. It's not because he did any good thing. Remember when he first shows up, he says, I am your servant to David. What do you want me to do? (laughs) What could he do? What if David said, here, buddy, here's a lawnmower. Go mow the palace grass. He can't do that. He can't even sweep good. I mean, you can't walk, you can't sweep, right? And it's like he couldn't run a vacuum, couldn't clean windows. I mean, in my opinion, if your kid can't do any of that stuff, Go ahead and move them out, right? I mean, it's like, come on now. Just joking, just joking. But Mephibosheth couldn't do any of this stuff. But David said, come on, buddy. Here is a seat at the table. You're going to be eating with the king. Good food. He's been in Lodabar begging for food, begging. Now he's here in the palace. What did he do to deserve that? Nothing. It was grace. You see, some people have the idea that good is good. Good equals good results. And there are loads of people who think, I can do enough good and balance these scales, and if the good outweighs the bad, then, whoo, pearly gates, here I come. I think that is one of the enemy's greatest lies that good people go to heaven, that good people are blessed by God. Mephibosheth blows that theory out of the water. He couldn't do anything good. He couldn't help, couldn't cook, couldn't clean, just sit there and eat the king's food. Where was the good in that? None. Just grace. Just grace. David said, we have nothing in common. I'm a fighter. I like to go hunting. I can't carry you and the deer. Disgrace. You're you're of really no value, except I'm going to be kind to you because of the covenant. Church, it's the same way for us. God doesn't need us. You think he needs me? No way. He doesn't need us at all. But he says, you know what? I made a promise way back to Abraham, fulfilled it through Jesus, and because of the blood covenant, One day, you're going to eat at my table called the marriage supper of the Lamb. All for grace. Grace. And you know what helps my faith a little bit is to remember grace. It helps my faith to remember that I can do one good thing and somebody pull out in front of me and then the scales go this way. Are you all that way? I can trust God fully but watch the news and the scales go. It goes the other way. I need grace. I need God's grace, and you need God's grace. You're going to stand up? We're going to sing that song, Wilson, if you can. Um, When David sent for Mephibosheth, he still had a choice. He could have said, nah, I'm fine here in Lodabar. Just, Just leave me here. I like begging. I like, you know, just kind of rolling around like, no, no. So David did. I think David would have left him. I think the, the helper would have left him there. But he said, nah, this, I just believe. I'm going to trust that he might kill me. 
He might take me out, but I'm just going to trust. It'll be okay. He gets to the palace. And first thing David said, hey, buddy, don't be afraid. I'm going to honor my word. And the same church is true for you and I. Don't ever think you can do enough good to please God. You can't. You see, good deeds don't save. But if you are saved, you'll do good deeds. Okay, there's no way a grace doesn't wash out the good works. It's the fruit of being saved. All right? So today, if you're thinking, well, one day I'll get it all together, and one day I'll stop this, and one day I'll stop and stop and start, I think that ain't going to happen. Okay? You need God's grace. In the same way David reached out to Mephibosheth, God is reaching out to us, and he's saying, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of your past. Don't be afraid of Paul. Paul. Don't be afraid of what you've done. Grace. 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 And this morning, you have a choice. You can keep trying to balance the scales, or you can say, you know what? This is too hard. I'm exhausted trying to do the right thing. I'm trying, I'm exhausted trying to make good decisions. I keep goofing up. You need grace. You need God's grace. And once you realize that that one song we said, how good he is, how good he is, the outflow of your heart will then be, just give me, just give me Jesus. Today, I am very thankful for the grace of God. I can never do enough good. I can never measure up. But when God looks at Mickey, he looks at me through the blood of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus, you know what it says about me? You're perfect. That's good news, right? You're perfect. And what God sees and God thinks, that's really all that matters. And so today, have you made that choice? Have you made that choice to say, you know what? I need God's grace. And if you've experienced God's grace, are you walking in it? Are you living like you have experienced the grace of God? Have you thanked him for his grace? lately. This morning, we're going to sing that great old hymn. And uh, if you know it, sing it. Uh, let it be a time of worship if you've experienced it. And this morning, if, it's a, if you need it, make sure you make that choice. God, I need your grace. And I want the Holy Spirit of God, we pray that you would do what only you can do. God, you know who has experienced your grace, and God, you know who hasn't. Father, you know who's walking in it and who is not. God, you know who is trying to take advantage of it and who is not. God, you know who needs to be thankful for it. And God, for the people who are thinking like, oh my goodness, this generational thing, what am I going to do about that? It's grace of God, grace of God. May they surrender that to you, we pray in Jesus' name. This morning, altar's open. If you need to come, feel free.